Good morning and welcome to Community Conversations. My name is Kathy Jordan and I am the chair for the Elmhurst Senior Commission. Thank you so much today for coming out in this nice fall weather when you could actually be out there raking leaves. Um, I'd like to thank Mayor Morley and the City Council for all of their support for Community Conversations and without them we couldn't have that, uh, have this presentation. I'd also like to thank the Education Committee. We have uh, Grayson Haller, who is here, we have Ruth Maple, and we have Gail Anderson. And our presentations, we like to make sure that we educate the community so that in case there's a crisis, you are armed with good information so that you can make good decisions. Today, our presentation is about opioids and older adults. This presentation will review the risks and benefits of older adult opioid users in order to help seniors, their family members, and provide care providers to make good decisions. Presented by Kate Mahoney, Executive Director from Naomi Ruth Cohen Institute for Mental Health Education. Welcome, Kate, and we're really anxious to hear about this really well-known topic that everyone is continually talking about. Thank you for coming today. Good morning. It's really such an honor to be here today to be able to talk about this really important topic. And um, I wanted to mention that the institute that I run, the Naomi Ruth Cohen Institute for Mental Health Education, is located at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. And I work with a lot of um, brilliant faculty members, um, graduate students, and, and now we actually also have undergraduate students, really working on trying to provide education around mental health topics um, to help each of us be able to make healthier choices for ourselves. And the reason we're talking about this particular topic today, opioids with older adults, is that there's been a lot of conversation about the opioid crisis, but often it leaves off those of us who um, are more mature adults. We see a lot of focus on teenagers, um, young or emerging adults, and less conversation about older adults, and for most of us as we age, we are more likely to be prescribed pain medications, et cetera. So for many of us, we really need to better understand the risks and the benefits of opioid use. Um, so one of the things I always like to say as a caveat to this is um, we sometimes in our culture do um, kind of make the error of we go, uh, things are black and white, every um, medication is in, you know, the new best thing in the world to it's horrible. And the truth is most medications, all of us as patients, when we see our doctors, need to be doing a cost-benefit analysis, figuring out kind of some of the health challenges we're trying to manage, taking a look at what are the benefits of a potential solution and what are the risks of a potential solution. I'm gonna warn everyone to sneeze. Sneeze is coming, I think. <laughs> it's, <coughs> a beautiful fall day, which brings with it all the wonderful things that fly in the air. So my apologies for that. So just kind of talking a little bit about what opioids are. And this is a, even a term that many of us didn't use until recent years or didn't think about. So opioids are really medications, by and large, that can relax our body. Um, they can treat pain in a variety of different contexts. And um, we see it a lot with both post-surgical pain, um, and we see um, opioids being used a lot in chronic end-of-life care. Um, but we also, um, there are opioids that are um, non-prescription opioids that we are seeing used. So um, in the same big family of drugs, we also see um, street drugs like heroin or some of the um, illegal or black market um, fentanyl that we hear a lot about in the news today as well. So two of the most common opioids that we probably hear about though are um, oxycodone, um, hydrocodone, um, which is also sold as, as Vicodin as a brand name. So that's one of the other things I think as we're all trying to sort through our medications is there's the generic names, there's the brand names, trying to keep track of everything. It can feel a little bit overwhelming um, and we just want to take a look at that. I do want to mention um, one of the things that we try and do in general when we talk about the issue about um, substance use and, and prescription medications that sometimes end up being misused is trying to encourage people to think about that if um, you have old medications that you were prescribed for a previous health episode or condition that you no longer need to use, 
or sadly, um, some of us have had this uh, in terms of caring for a loved one who's no longer with us, thinking about safe ways to dispose of medications is really important. Um, right here in Elmhurst, people can bring any unused or unneeded now medications to the local police department. Um, there's a drop box there. Um, I believe also at Elmhurst Hospital, you have that as an option as well. Um, uh, we're filming this today on um, October 26, which is one of the uh, two days in the year that's the National Drug Take Back Day, where um, there are places where people can bring medications on this day. It's a reminder to um, safely discard medications. So if people have excess medications, we don't want people to toss them in the trash or to tra put them through the plumbing system, through a garbage disposal or, um, or plumbing, we want to make sure that what we're really doing is safely disposing of those things because we don't really want it in the soil, we don't want it in our water supply. So when people don't need medications any longer, we want to make sure that we're safely disposing of them. That's one of the things that's put some people at risk is just having excess medications around that they don't need or they lose track of and then sometimes someone else in our home gets access to them. So we really want to be careful and, and promote safe uh, drug safety. So some of the commonly prescribed opioids for older adults would be hydrocodone, oxycodone, as I mentioned, codeine. So codeine's been um, an opioid that's been used for many, many years. Codeine's often been used for, it's a cough suppressant. So um, I can remember as a child, um, we could actually get over-the-counter cough medicine that inclu included codeine before it was regulated in the way that it is now. Um, codeine's also sometimes used in some of the anti-diarrheal um, medications that are prescribed so we want to help people understand that you know, coding, again, can serve some very important functions, but we want to manage it. Many people have been prescribed um, Tylenol 3 or 4, which is Tylenol with coding at different levels for um, post-dental procedures, et cetera. So just really wanting to make sure we're kind of aware of what comes into this big family of medications that we call opioids. Um, morphine. Morphine is a common medication people would get, in the, particularly in hospital care, post-surgical. It can be really useful in terms of helping people manage the pain um, that they've had after surgery. And I do want to mention, again, the functionality of opioids is for many people, when we've had a surgical procedure, and if you've been in the hospital recently or had a surgery, one of the goals is getting people up and moving as quickly as possible after a surgery, whether you've had an orthopedic surgery, so a knee replacement, a hip replacement, or something, a different type of surgery related to heart, liver, et cetera, they really want to make sure that we're out there and moving as quickly as possible because we know movement is so important to our health and functioning. But sometimes things really hurt after surgery. So when they give us um, an opioid in the hospital and they're starting to get us to like walk up and down the hall with a physical therapist or occupational therapist, um, that can be really useful. We just want to make sure we're balancing it and that we know, you know how much somebody should be taking for how long and how that might interact with the other medications that they're taking as well. So again, I really want to emphasize the potential benefits. Um, fentanyl is something we're hearing a lot about in the news right now. And we're hearing a lot about fentanyl for a couple of reasons. There are, fentanyl is an FDA-approved drug that you will see prescribed for a variety of reasons. There are things called fentanyl patches, so when people want um, some help with pain management, not a systemic. They might get the fentanyl patch. But we are seeing an influx in our country, particularly coming in from Southeast Asia, of black market fentanyl that is not being measured for its strength or potency. That is one of the reasons for a lot of the accidental overdoses that we're seeing in our country. You know, We're losing more than 40,000 people a year to opioid overdoses. And so fentanyl is a, a large um, reason for that. And this illicit fentanyl that's coming through that is not regulated. So we want to be sure that we realize that there might be a reason that a physician would think that fentanyl is the best medication for a patient. That's very different than some of what we're hearing on the news, which is stuff that has not been tested for its strength or potency, that's coming in from a foreign country and it's coming in through a black market. So we want to be cautious that we um, are, are tracking the differences between those. Um, tramadol is another common um, opioid. So I'm not going to read all of them, but just, you know, there's a broad range. Um, some of them have different strengths and potencies. Some of them are better for one type of pain than another. And so, again, it's always a patient with their physician making a decision together about what makes the most sense. 
One thing I do want to mention is that it is really important that we all keep a really good li current list of the medications that we're taking. Um, now we can sometimes feel a little like, oh, maybe I don't have to worry so much. There's electronic health record systems. When I go to the hospital, they see my list of medications. But they really only see the list that is related to prescribers in their system. So some of us might be getting our health care regularly, say, at Elmhurst um, Edwards Hospital, but we might see a specialist someplace else. Um, they're not going to know what's going on necessarily with what our, you know, anything we may have been prescribed by our dentist, et cetera. So we really, each of us, regardless of our age, should be thinking about having a current up-to-date list that we um, manage in terms of what our current medications are, what dosage, how often we're supposed to take them, and who the prescribing physician is, and then even more importantly, What's the purpose? Why are we taking this? Sometimes, if we have multiple health conditions, we might even lose track of which medication is for which condition. And so one thing that can happen is people continue to take something when they no longer really need it, because they you know, get used to saying, like, I take nine pills every day, and, it's, and we don't keep track of, I'm taking this for my blood pressure, I'm taking this for my cholesterol, I'm taking this for whatever. So wanting to make sure we're tracking that. I would, really would like to say your pharmacist is your friend. So try to go, even if we have multiple physicians we see, some specialists, our primary care physician, it's really great if we go to one single pharmacy to get our medications um, because often pharmacists will be able to track things that, oh, this could be risky taking these things together. So it's a great practice to think about ways that we can be looking after our own health and safety by you know, just engaging in a few of these practices would be helpful. So today, when we hear all the news about the opioid um, crisis, sometimes it can feel a little overwhelming, right? Like you hear about it, it can feel like all the time. I'm worried some people are kind of getting tired of talking about it, but it is still one of our most significant public health issues right now, and we really do want to make sure we're tracking it. So we're losing in our country a pers one person about every 19 minutes to a, a drug overdose. And um, when we look at that in terms of, and that's related to prescription misuse. If you add into it street drugs, it's even more than that. But for every unintentional overdose death that we have, we also have about nine people who be, would be admitted to substance use treatment. Um, I do want to say this is um, taken from data. So I used and this term because that's the term they used in the research, substance abuse treatment. But we're changing the language. So we no longer talk about substance abuse, actually. We, um, the last time they came out with the revised uh, DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual 5, um, the new, new terminology are substance use disorders. And then within substance use disorders, there can be mild, moderate, or severe disorders. Um, so we're trying to get rid of the term abuse because we found that that was actually stigmatizing. And sometimes that was interfering with people getting help for a substance use problem because of the term. Um, so we want to think about it and make sure we're looking at substance use issues and mental health issues as health issues very similar to other physical conditions some of us might be living with in terms of um, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. So we've got about nine people for every one person that dies that we get into treatment, which is actually getting people into treatment is a really good thing. It's a goal. Um, about 35 people ending up um, in emergency rooms related to a drug overdose that ends up not being fatal, right? That they come to the ER and we're able to revive that person. Um, 161 people who would report that they um, have um, misused substances or are dependent on substances, on um, opioids in particular. And um, 461, so nearly 500 people for every death, we have about 500 people who are using um, prescriptions but in a non-medical way. So that they've been prescribed opioids, but by non-medical use, we're talking about people using at quantities greater than what was prescribed, frequency greater than prescribed, or they're actually using medication that was really prescribed for someone else. So people might get access to an opioid that was um, prescribed for a neighbor, a friend, a, a parent, a grandparent, and the person taking it, is not, it was not ever prescribed for them. And that's risky because, again, 
all prescriptions should be taken in the context of what our health risks are and what other medications were being prescribed. So we really want to kind of look at that. One of the things, though, and one of the reasons I like to make sure we're not leaving older adults out of the equation, partly because I fall into that category, but also because we want to make sure that we realize um, that for many of us as older adults, it will uh, impact us potentially differently. And we are, the older we get, typically the more prescriptions we each have. So if you compare the medicine cabinet of a 30-year-old versus a 60-year-old versus a 90-year-old, they tend to be different because we tend to, as we age, have more medical conditions. Um, and prescriptions are a great way that physicians are treating a lot of our, the conditions that we're managing, whether they be chronic conditions that we live with and are probably going to live with for the rest of our lives versus acute conditions in terms of things that happen to us, whether it's, again, a surgery, um, an injury, or something that is um, time limited. But in 2016, so this is the last piece of data that I have available, um, one in three of us who are on part, Medicare Part D have, um, have been prescribed an opioid. So really taking a look at that, we really want to make sure that we realize that a lot of older adults have access to opioids, are being prescribed those by their physicians, and wanting to make sure we're thinking about those. And that, that because there's been a lot of misconception about substances, we often aren't sure kind of how they're impacting us or our loved ones. So we really want to be talking a little bit about how those things work. Um, the US is sadly um, the leader in consumption of opioids across the whole globe. So nearly 100% of the hydrocodone prescriptions and 81% of the oxycodone prescriptions um, were consumed by Americans. And we know that we have more than 2 million, and probably quite a few more, um, who are uh, dependent on these medications and have developed uh, physical dependence. You'll see here there's a map of the United States. And actually, Illinois, by and large, is um, on the lower end in terms of our per capita um, prescriptions for opioids. Um, and some of the other states have a much more dense use of opioids. Um, again, I want to keep giving you the message that there are very important medical reasons why uh, our doctors may prescribe opioids, and we don't want to be afraid of that. One of the things I find as I do these talks throughout Illinois is many of us also, though, ask our doctors, are there other medications that might be less risky that could still be effective with my um, managing my pain? Or even without medications, are there other things I should be looking at? Should I be looking at massage? Should I be looking at... Um, other kinds of interventions in terms of relaxation, in terms of um, looking at, at strategies that could be effective in managing my pain other than a prescription. So we do want to be sure we're asking those questions and we're having a dialogue with our physician. So I do want to mention some of us um, grew up where we learned that we weren't really supposed to question doctors, that doctors were up on a pedestal. They'd been to medical school. They had done residency. They'd been practicing and kind of you know, whatever they say we should be doing, we pretty much followed their recommendations. I'm really encouraging us more and more to have an open dialogue with our physicians where we're asking any questions we might have that we, and we're talking about what we're experiencing, whether it be side effects, whether it be the pain we're experiencing, and whether their treatment plan for us is being effective, and so that it feels like it's a joint collaborative process and that we have a part of our treatment plan as well. So that's an important thing. And one thing that can help with that is sometimes taking another um, loved one with us, a friend, a caregiver, a family member, when we go to the doctor and making a list in advance of the questions we have and the things we want to be sure that we tell our physician so that he or she can make a good um, recommendation as well. So you know they're doing their best in the short amount of time that they have to assess what our um, our problems are, our complaints are, our needs are, and make a recommendation. But we can be helpful the more we communicate and we come prepared for those appointments. And then we want to make sure we're asking questions. And if you get a prescription and you go home and you start taking that prescription, but you don't feel right on it, if you, you don't like the way it makes you feel, that you're coming back to your physician, and even if you don't get back in for an appointment that you're calling, you're talking to the nurse, and you're saying, I'm experiencing these, I don't know if they're side effects, I'm experiencing these effects, and 
I'm not so sure I feel good about those. Can we check with the doctor? So making sure we're being as proactive as possible is really an essential component in terms of looking at that. Um, so basically, we're looking at um, these projections from back in 2004 to where we're just about to be in 2020, a pretty much a doubling of the misuse of opioids by older adults, where older adults are using, again, either opioids that weren't prescribed for them or using greater quantity or frequency than what was prescribed or for a longer duration. Um, you often you'll see a prescription written that'll say, take this every four to six hours for pain as needed. And so the, that as needed, I always think they should put that in all capital letters in bold to remind us that we're supposed to keep evaluating, do I still need this? You know, is, is the pain still pretty debilitating or should I be thinking about a tapering off plan? Um, but again, we can get in the habit. We've already maybe loaded our week-long or month-long um, pill case and there's one or two or three in there for every day, and we might just sort of take them out of habit without asking ourselves the question of, do I still need this? So that's another important piece that we need to take a look at. Um, so basically, you know, when we look back, the last time I got good data on this was a while ago now, but 15% of seniors back in 2011 were being prescribed an opioid when they were discharged from the hospital. So again, where they thought that was part of the discharge plan, give someone an opioid to manage the pain for someone who's maybe, again, had a surgery or has been in for another reason that has a pain component to it. But that's a pretty high number. That's about one in six of us. And so we want to make sure that we're clear about that. And um, because there can be these potential risks. So the two biggest risks for older adults thinking about their use of, of opioids is, um, an increased risk of falls. If you're taking opioids, you're four to five times more likely to, um, to suffer a fall. And that's complicated for us as we age because we typically have um, decreased bone density. So a fall is more likely for those of us as we're aging to lead to a fracture. And a fracture then can have a more devastating uh, consequence for us because then that leads to decreased mobility and it, we get on the slippery slope. So again, one of the things that we would encourage people that if somebody is being prescribed an opioid to manage pain, that we're also training people to think about how do you, what can you do for fall prevention? One of the most important things I would tell people is that as you're getting up from a seated position, say to get up to you go to the restroom or go out to get a snack in the kitchen or um, some, you know, answer your doorbell, that you take the time when you first stand up to stand up and before you move, Make sure you're feeling okay, you don't feel lightheaded at all because opioids can lead to people feeling a, a sense of lightheadedness. And that you take a moment to make sure you're feeling stable and you look and you plan your route. So if I'm getting up from sitting in a recliner chair and I'm going to the restroom that I look, I make sure, gee, that nobody else that was in my house left shoes in the way or something else in terms of that, that I'm thinking about how I'm gonna walk safely or if I'm answering the doorbell, that I'm not gonna let myself feel rushed. I don't care if the person's rung the bell a second or third time. What I wanna do is think about, okay, I've got some medications that can make me feel a little lightheaded. I wanna answer the door, I wanna be welcoming, but I'm gonna take my time getting there to make sure I'm getting there safely. So we wanna think about those factors. Another um, potential risk factor, because a very serious side effect for many of us with um, opioids is constipation. So a lot of us as we age already feel some slowing of our, the functioning of our GI system. And um, one, of the, one of the effects for many years, um, people were prescribed opioids to manage issues about um, chronic diarrhea and other problems. So the challenge is you might need or benefit from an opioid to manage pain, but you might also be struggling with some GI issues. So we wanna make pe sure people are aware of those things. And then it can decrease our respiration. So for those of us who might have some issues in terms of breathing, um, or we might be taking multiple medications that could impact respiration, we want to be looking at those potential side effects and drug interactions. And as we mentioned that, there's um, another potential risk can be the mixing of opioids with um, benzodiazepine, so some of the anti-anxiety medications like Valium and Librium. And then um, a substance that many people use recreationally, which is alcohol. So you can have an interaction between alcohol and opioids, alcohol and 
benzodiazepines and people who are who maybe drink alcohol regularly as part of um, with meals or as part of their evening ritual um, may need to be looking at that also in connection with the medications that they're being prescribed. One of the things we find is a lot of physicians don't ask us as we get older. They tend to ask uh, teens and young adults about whether or not they drink or use other substances. The, as we age, and particularly as we have the experience of where our, our physicians and nurses are younger than we are, sometimes they feel like it's disrespectful to ask us, or they have a stereotype that we don't drink much alcohol. Um, and so it's important that we really are, again, talking to our care providers about that and recognizing the potential interaction between um, alcohol, opioids, and again, benzodiazepines are another medication we really want to make sure people are looking at together. So we want to have those conversations and make sure that we're looking at, again, our safety and our health um, and the different things that we're taking into our body. Um, a couple things happen to us as we age. So um, we tend to process things more slowly. So even um, when they decide to prescribe a medication and tell us we should take it every four hours or every six hours or once a day, a lot of that has to do with the half-life of the medication, how long it takes to get absorbed into our system. And so it, it may be that what is recommended by a pharmaceutical company, um, they're typically not doing uh, research on older adults in terms of uh, when they look at um, the protocols for a medication. So we might need to take something uh, at a different frequency. So our physicians should be thinking about our age when they're thinking about what they're prescribing to us as well. And then um, if we have, so most things that we uh, take through our system, medications, prescription medications, alcohol, get processed through our liver as well. And we typically have decreased liver functioning and kidney functioning as we age. So that might also, um, impact issues about the dosage and what's right for us at varying stages in terms of in our, in our life cycle. Um, so when we think a little bit more, um, basically the percentage of adults over 50 who've um, misuse um, opioids has continued to e increase in general over time with the prevalence of opioid use. And um, the, again, our liver functioning means it puts us at greater risk in terms of having um, negative consequences that could include fatalities with substances. So kind of thinking about how did we get here? When we hear about the opioid crisis all the time, what caused it, what led to this? And some of it are things that were actually, again, um, potentially for some either good intentions or um, some potential misuse. So, Actually, basically, before even what I have listed on the slide, back in 1980, there were two physicians who wrote a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a one-paragraph letter to the editor that got published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was not a research study. It was not a peer-reviewed article. It was a letter to the editor. And basically, they had gone back and done a retrospective study of a little bit under 4,000 patients who had been prescribed um, opioids as part of what, well, at some point while they were in the hospital. And they basically said very few of them came back um, with a, like an opioid dependence. So it means their conclusion was that opioids are safe and non-habit forming and don't lead to dependence or addiction. Um, it was a little bitty, you know, I think it was five sentences. Um, and then people started quoting them as if it were a research article. So you hear these two doctors referenced a lot. One of them was from Boston University. And they were just taking a look at this from a, almost a curiosity perspective. So we had that happening. We also had, and the Veterans Administration started this, but then the Joint Commission um, on the Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, which is located right near here over in Oak Brook Terrace, they started saying, you know, we should be, um, better managing patients' pain. As part of trying to increase patient satisfaction, the kind of care and compassionate care we're delivering. Um, so that was when we started, um, they started doing what we call treating pain as the fifth vital sign. So if you think about how often now, especially if you're in an emergency department, but even sometimes in other um, medical settings, people will ask you on a scale of one to 10, what's your pain level? 
right? And they treat that and they chart that in our medical charts in the same way they're charting our blood pressure, our temperature, our um, oxygen saturation, our pulse, et cetera. So it's the fifth thing that gets marked. And so in, even before people had cell phones with all the smiley faces, the emojis on there, they, you often would see these pain scales in an emergency department where they would show you the varying level of dissatisfaction, because you're really hurting a lot, to satisfaction and where your pain level was. And so that was a good thing, right? It was about saying we need to care for how our patients, not just about how we're curing them, but how are they feeling and how are we communicating with our patients. But what we started seeing is then with that, a big increase in the prescription of opioids. Because when people were saying, yeah, you know, I kind of hurt, um, they started prescribing that. Another factor is some of the changes that's happening in our healthcare system. So when I think, of course, uh, across my lifetime, it seems like you get less and less and less time with your doctor. They are like in a hurry. And if you talk to anybody who works in a doctor's office, they will tell you how you know, they're often allocating somewhere between, you know, like six and 15 minutes, depending on the kind of um, practice it is, um, for a doctor to spend with a particular patient. So when doctors have less time to talk, to listen, to ask us questions and hear about what's happening, they are trying to be as responsive as they can in the short period of time that they're allotted with us. And so um, if you think about it, one way for us to feel heard, like our doctor listened to us and did something, is if we walk out of there with a prescription. And you'll see I'm dating myself, right? I pretend as if we're getting, mostly we don't walk out with a piece of paper anymore. Mostly we walk out being told that they have electronically communicated with our pharmacy and we could go and pick up from our local Walgreens or Oscar or whatever our prescription. But um, but it kind of feels like they something happened, right? They did something for us. We went, we talked about what we were experiencing, they did something for us, and they gave us a prescription. And so we are then optimistic that the treatment plan, the prescription is gonna help us, and we will soon feel better. So that was another contributing factor, is we were focusing on more patient satisfaction. Physicians have often less time to spend with us, to look at other solutions. And then people were starting to be evaluating. So both uh, patient satisfaction surveys, groups like the Joint Commission, um, when they come out and they look at a hospital or they look at um, a mental health center or a substance use treatment center uh, that they accredit, they want to look at what's your patient satisfaction data. And one way for patients to feel satisfied is to feel like my, my practitioners heard me, they treated me, and I am not experiencing pain. I'm feeling physically better. So all those things added to, and then we had some large pharmaceutical companies who engaged in very aggressive marketing of their um, opioid medications that they were had for sale. And we just saw this past week, there were four large pharmaceutical companies that entered into a settlement agreement, I believe with the state of Oklahoma. Um, but they're not the first. We've heard a lot of this happening in terms of the pharmaceutical companies kind of being called on the carpet for maybe they were overly aggressive in their sales and maybe they left out some important data as they were talking about the potential uses and benefits of the medication and the potential risks, side effects, or negative consequences. And so what's important, again, pharmaceutical companies are doing some great research. We make advances in a lot of treatment. Um, but we really have to look at um, the balancing act. And it is important that they're giving us all the data so that when a physician's making a decision, they understand what could this medication do for my patient how could it help my patient? What are the potential risks? And how can my patient and I together discuss those and decide what makes the most sense? So we really want to make sure we're doing that. There is one other factor that's um, come into be in general with medications, which is, um, again, those of us who have the wisdom and life experience will remember there was a time when pharmaceutical companies could not 
directly market to consumers. There was a time before we saw all those commercials on TV that tell us how a medication is going to save our life and increase our functioning, but then at the bottom has all those small print about all the potential risks and consequences. So when we started seeing more direct marketing of pharmaceutical companies directly to consumers, we also saw patients going into their doctor's office and asking for certain things. So if somebody's saying, you know, who's maybe not ready to um, take the more aggressive step to have a hip replacement or a knee replacement, saying to their doctor, but I'm in a lot of pain. I'm not ready for a surgery yet, but can you give me something to manage the pain? So we really want to um, add that to the mix as well. That has sort of shifted a little bit about how we think about um, medications and what they can do for us and what the risks are. Um, so with all this, we're really seeing um, that physicians have had to change some of their practices short time. They have more medications available to them. And so they are trying to, again, help us as the consumers feel as good as we can and function. So you know, one of the really important things, again, particularly for those of us as we're aging, is thinking about we do want to manage our pain so that we continue to move. So when you're in a lot of pain, you tend to become more sedentary, which is not good for our health. Um, so I, uh, in fact, I'm missing right now. I take a Tai Chi class every Saturday morning, typically. And one of my uh, Tai Chi instructor's favorite sayings is, you know, motion is lotion, right? Motion helps us move. It helps our joints keep moving. It's good for us. And so for some people, by, by taking uh, medication to manage their pain, they continue to go walking with their neighbor every morning, or it keeps them getting around. And we do want to be as active as we can, um, not only to because it helps add to our enjoyment in life, helps with our social connectedness. But being active also helps our other physical health conditions. So there is this balancing act that we want to be looking at. We want to make sure that we're all thinking about how can we manage what's going on in our bodies um, and make sure that we're continuing to be out there enjoying life um, and being active for the social and physical benefits of that activity. Um, so when we take a look at um, prescriptions, so often when we talk about opioids and the way opioids are being prescribed, they differentiate the use of opioids for the treatment of pain related to cancer and all the other prescriptions for opioids. So we um, are seeing more and more use of opioids and increase largely in the treatment of non-cancer conditions. Um, for acute pain, which is that kind of pain that might be short-lived but very severe, um, and, um, and then subacute pain, which might be more chronic pain that we might live with for a longer period of time. Um, and so and for some musculoskeletal conditions that many of us, again, have increased risk for as we age, so things like arthritis, um, rheumatism, um, uh, chronic neck and back problems, um, frequent or severe headaches. Um, many of us had um, injuries at, earlier in our lives related to either our work or some of our um, pleasure activities where we might have had a back injury related to a fall or um, being overly aggressive in terms of forms of exercise or whatever, and now we kind of live with that back pain. And living with chronic back pain can feel very difficult. You can't, sometimes it feels hard to get comfortable. Sitting is difficult, standing is difficult, sleep, laying in bed is difficult. So we see people sometimes using more and more um, medications to try and manage those kinds of conditions. And basically almost half, 43% of American adults report um, having some kind of musculoskeletal condition. Um, and about 20% of people who have those conditions um, will receive a opioid prescription. So about one in five people who have some of those pain conditions are going to be prescribed an opioid. So that you know, ends up being quite a few of us. It's a large percentage. Um, there are some non-opioid -al um, alternatives. Acetaminophen is really common, right? You know, the Tylenol versions. Um, the NSAIDs, now I do want to mention that right, more and more we are hearing um, warnings about um, chronic use of the NSAIDs, so the ibuprofen type medications, and the impact that can have on our kidneys and livers if we use it on a chronic condition, you know, to treat a chronic condition. So we do want to make sure that we're also, when we're talking to our doctors, in addition to the medication list that are prescription medications that we get from a pharmacy, that we're talking about any over-the-counter 
um, medications that we're taking as well. One, again, so that they can um, understand about potential interactions. But secondly, some of us have mistakenly felt like, hey, if I didn't need a prescription and if I can just walk into the store and buy the jumbo bottle of this, um, it must be pretty safe because it got approved for that type of sale. But it still can have an impact on our body. So we want to be talking to our healthcare providers about the over-the-counter medications we're taking as well. Um, we see some people who found pain relief through use of gabapentin, which is a, a non-opioid pain um, medication. Um, there are some people who, when they take some of the antidepressants, the tricyclics, the um, serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors, that they feel benefits related to how they feel physically as well. And then there are some topical treatments for pain. So um, like a lidocaine or um, some of those that you add topically, they're not systemic, they're not going through our whole body, but they can help with pain in certain places. Um, and so that's really important. And I've seen more and more advances with some of people, particularly who have um, knee issues, you know, joint issues related to um, osteoarthritis, et cetera, um, finding help from some of the different kinds of injections that they do directly into the site as opposed to systemic things. So, uh, every year we're getting new advances in the treatment of pain. We want to make sure, too, that we feel like our providers, the doctors that we see, are kind of keeping up to date on the new potential things that they could be using and that we're talking to them so that they understand we want to be aware of the risks or potential negative consequences in addition to understanding the potential benefits of anything they're prescribing to us. Oops. Oh, sorry. Um, so when we think about, there are these age-related physical changes that can happen to us in terms of um, certain things that can be more concentrated or potent because of our, um, what's going on in terms of how our metabolism changes. Um, I mentioned earlier the liver and kidney functioning. And then the other thing is the, our body composition. So um, the percentage of body fat varies as we age. And this isn't so much about how we look, but it's what's going on inside. And, um, medications can have a less immediate effect. And one of the risks that we see with opioids for people is if you have an opioid that has a, a slower acting, so instead of a quick, quick impact and then you start, the medication starts to wear off quickly, the more slow acting medications, sometimes people take them and then they're like, you know what, that didn't really do anything for me. I think I'm gonna take another one. Um, and so they don't follow all the instructions that are on the bottle or that were given by their doctor, but instead they, took something, they didn't get the immediate response that they were hoping for, they take more, and then that all starts to build up in their system. And again, because our liver functioning and kidney functioning are slower as we age, we can get to a toxic buildup um, within our system, so we want to be cautious about that. Um, you know, and I, I mentioned that in some of these things, you know, as I, before we got started with taping today, as people were arriving early, um, some people were kind of saying like, well, why are we talking about opioids with older adults? And, and it is important to realize that our bodies are changing and that means that medications can impact us differently. So there is a reason to kind of think about that as well. Um, and the fact that we, again, tend to have more different prescriptions, so it's more to keep track of. Um, so they can really, again, benefit, help us maintain movement and independence, something we all want, right? As we're aging, we still want to feel like we can get around, we can take care of ourselves for as long as possible. Um, but we do want to make sure that we're looking at this lack of coordination, risk of fall, the constipation, respiratory issues. And we do not want to forget that there are older adults who develop substance use disorders. And again, so often no one in our world is looking for that. Um, so this can happen both from the interactions I mentioned earlier or our use, our continued use of opioids. Um, particularly, I want to say sometimes as we age, we might also, as we start feeling potentially more isolated um, as we've lost uh, dear friends of ours, et cetera, um, that we can start sometimes using opioids really kind of to, to treat depression and loneliness. And so uh, when we're using a pain medication, that's not even really particularly effective to be treating uh, symptoms of depression, right? It's not, that's not the intended use. But we might not even really realize that what we're using it for is just to feel a little better and feel a little bit detached. But 
we have to ask ourselves, shouldn't we try to get something that's specifically for treating the depression and something that might have fewer risks or consequences for us? So we want to look at that. Um, and we do want to make sure that the care providers we see are paying attention to could we potentially have a substance use disorder? So there are, you know, at the national level, the, a branch of the federal government that looks at substance um, use disorders and mental health conditions is called SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse, again, I wish they would change that name, Mental Health Services Administration. And they have several publications specifically on um, substance use disorders and older adults. Um, and so we want to make sure that we realize that that is a potential risk. Often we don't think about it ourselves as something that could happen to us or a loved one or a very dear friend of ours. So we want to make sure we're um, looking at that and making sure we're interacting and having face-to-face -face interactions with our providers. So some of us, so when we're not feeling great, wish that we could talk to our doctor over the phone. Can't I just call in, have some, talk to the nurse, and have the doctor call a prescription in for me? But that does decrease the likelihood that we're going to have this interactive communication we want to have. I realize it gets difficult. Some of us aren't driving anymore. Some of us, our schedules are complicated. Um, but it is really recommended that we do as much as we can face to face with our um, care providers so that they're seeing how we're doing and we're actively asking questions and benefiting from how that's going. Um, so I wanted to just mention, we're not going to go in detail about these, but to determine whether or not someone might have a substance use disorder, just like any other health conditions, you know, there are, and many of us who get um, explanation of benefits from our insurance providers, um, we notice that there's a, usually a diagnosis, and then they talk about whatever treatment we had related to the diagnosis. So there is, um, and a lot of those come out of a manual that's called the ICD-9, or and now I think we're on the ICD-10. But for mental health and substance use, they're using the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, and there are 11 criteria to de um, determine whether or not someone might have a substance use disorder. <coughs> and based on the number of criteria someone might meet, they, if they do have a substance use disorder, it might be mild, moderate, or severe. Now, it is really important to recognize many people use um, alcohol, street drugs, prescription medications, where they don't meet a criteria for having a disorder, um, but we want to make sure that they're, you recognize that it's not just a, an arbitrary um, label, but that there are clear criteria that people should be assessing for just to see if that happens. So there are the 11 different criteria. And I do want to mention, I've had a, a scenario where um, a, a woman who was in her 40s called about her mom, who was in her 80s. And her mom lived with osteoarthritis and a lot of pain and was being um, um, prescribed Tylenol 3, which is Tylenol with codeine. And all of a sudden, because of all the news about the opioid crisis, this 40-something-year-old daughter wanted her mom to be off the medication right away. She's like, I didn't know my mom was taking an opioid. You know, I hear all this terrible news about it. And so I said, well, you know, what you really should do is, and she didn't live in the same city. Her mom was here in Chicago, and this daughter lived actually on the East Coast. I said, you should try to plan a visit where you and your mom together can go see her doctor, her primary care doctor who's prescribing this, so you can ask your questions, but don't assume that it means that it, she shouldn't be taking it. You really want to ask your questions to the provider and make sure you and your mom both understand the risks and benefits and um, what the, the plan is. And this is something that is going to be used on an ongoing basis. And that may well be to help her continue to move. Or um, is it something that is a short-term plan? Or do you want to explore with the doctor and your mom, um, maybe looking at a non-opioid uh, treatment or management for the pain. But also, you know, your mom gets to decide. She's the patient. So, um, but we've, I'm worried that because we've had so much attention to this problem, that we've sometimes decided that these are, you know, evil or shouldn't be used. And again, there are very real reasons why someone might want to or need to use um, an opioid to treat pain or another, you know, a related condition. Um, because again, it can be a, uh, effective cough suppressant, it can be an effective medication um, for managing uh, chronic diarrhea or other problems. Um, so I really encourage that we would all ask, you know, be comfortable to ask our 
ourselves and our loved ones about their use and understand it. And I do want to say when people do end up having a diagnosis of an opioid use disorder and they're an older adult, we really recommend help that is very supportive. There's um, treatment, evidence-based treatment for treating older adults with an opioid use disorder and um, there are strategies that are really effective. So um, if people are, you know, are concerned, um, and I do want to mention one of the things that happens with opioids is if people have got, developed a physical dependence, which they could do under prescri prescribed conditions, stopping suddenly will cause withdrawal symptoms. And the withdrawal symptoms from opioids do include things like muscle aches, um, usually uh, diarrhea, difficulty in terms of managing body temperature, et cetera. It feels like a really bad flu. So somebody shouldn't just suddenly discontinue if they've developed a physical dependence on their own either. They should be talking to their physician. Rarely is it life-threatening. Actually, um, withdrawal from um, alcohol dependence it can be life-threatening. It's much more dangerous. But withdrawing from an opioid dependence can be really uncomfortable. So we want to make sure that people are um, not doing it just arbitrarily, that they're getting the support they need, and that people are around to help kind of manage them and help support them through that with withdrawal process. And the treatments that are available, there's medication-assisted treatment where someone would get another medication to help them um, manage their dependence. There are support groups, recovery groups, et cetera. So there's a lot of help for people who might develop a substance use disorder. Again, it's a small percentage of older adults, but it does happen, um, and there is help available. Sometimes people feel like if an older adult has a substance use disorder, kind of like let them be, let them continue to use. But because of the risks of that, we want to make sure people are being supportive. So with that, um, I want to thank everyone for your attention today. Um, it's, you know, it is an important topic. You've been a really wonderful audience. Um, my contact information is here. I am, again, at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, and I'm very happy to have people reach out to me if they have more questions about this important topic. And I just want to thank Elmhurst to, for inviting me to be here and for the opportunity to spread the word to keep people safe and healthy. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kate, for all of that wonderful information. It was chock full of many beneficial things, and we really appreciate you coming here today. Um, I always close with a quote. Wisdom is the reward you get for listening when you would have preferred to talk. So, you know, think about that just a little bit, and have an amazing day. Thank you so much for coming to Community Conversations, and we hope to see you in the springtime. I'm Lieutenant Jeff Hayes with the Elmhurst Fire Department. The threat of winter fires is real. Here are some winter fire facts. Over 900 people die in winter home fires each year. Over $2 billion in property loss occurs from winter home fires annually. 67% of winter fires occur in one and two family homes. Cooking is the leading cause of winter home fires. Between 5 and 8 p.m. is the most common time for winter home fires. Half of all heating fires occur in the months of December, January, and February. Heating equipment is involved in one of every six reported home fires and one in every home fire deaths. Be sure to pay attention to these details that can help prevent a winter fire. Install carbon monoxide alarms and test at least once a month. Have a qualified professional clean and inspect your chimney and furnace every year. Store cooled ashes in tightly covered metal containers and keep it outside at least 10 feet from your home and nearby buildings. Plug only one heat producing appliance into an outlet at a time. During the holidays, many of us decorate our house with festive lights, Christmas trees, and decorative candles. Here are a few fire safety tips to help us prevent fires during the holidays. 
Always read manufacturer's instructions for the number of holiday strands to connect. 40% of all home decoration fires are started by candles. The top four days for home candle fires are Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, and New Year's Day. Keep candles at least 12 inches away from anything that burns. Although live Christmas tree fires are not common, when they do occur, they are extremely dangerous. On average, one of every 34 reported home Christmas tree fires resulted in death. A heat source too close to the Christmas tree causes one of every four of the fires. Make sure your tree is at least three feet away from heat sources like fireplaces, radiators, space heaters, candles, or heat vents. Also, make sure your tree does not block any exits. Get rid of your tree after Christmas or when it is dry. When a light sparks on a Christmas tree, the tree and house will set fire quickly. A wreath is located at both of our fire stations. Each time we're called to a home for a holiday-related fire, we remove one of the red bulbs and replace it with a white one. Please help us keep this wreath red. But most importantly, you, your home, and your family safe this winter by following these fire prevention tips. From all of us at the Elmhurst Fire Department, happy holidays and stay safe, Elmhurst.